Welcome to the Psychology Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Hoy. The Psychology Talk Podcast is a unique conversation about psychology and behavioral health from around the globe. We help you expand your knowledge by connecting you in conversation with experts in the field. Topics include hypnosis and mind-body treatments, breakthroughs in neuroscience and psychology, social and ethical considerations of behavioral health and psychology, and international trends in mental health and wellness. While you're listening, please take a moment to subscribe to us and give us a like or a review. It helps us to grow and continue to provide you with quality information and interviews. And now, here is the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Karen Messina. Dr. Messina is a clinical psychologist and supervising and training analyst at the Washington Baltimore Center for Psychoanalysis and is on the medical staff of Johns Hopkins Medicine in Bethesda, Maryland. She maintains a full-time private practice in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Dr. Messina is the author of several books, including Misogyny, Projective Identification and Mentalization, and Aftermath, Healing from the Trump Presidency. Today, she is here to discuss her new book, Resurgence of Global Populism, a psychoanalytic study of projective identification, blame shifting, and the corruption of democracy. Dr. Messina, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, uh, I've been reading the book, and uh, I, it's a very important book. I think it's a really good mix of great research on the current political climate globally. So it must have taken a lot of time to really put this together. And also the application of, of practical uh, psychoanalytic ideas to how uh, populist leaders think and do what they do. Um, absolutely. Well, you've got that right. Yeah. Okay. I like to put a, a frame around this concept because it's, it's, um, it's a complex one and particularly, uh, it's particularly complex be, be, because there isn't agreement among a lot of people on exactly what it is. Some people think that it shouldn't be used because in one country, the person who is a populist looks very different than in another country. They're right-wing populists and left-wing populists. So that's one thought. Another thought is that um, it stigmatizes people and it's a stigmatizing concept and it should be eliminated. But the fact of the matter is it does exist. Something happens with leaders who exhibit certain traits. So I think it's what we have for now. And I think, I think we need to keep it because there is some understanding, some uh, common uh, uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. So, I think most people who do use the term think of it as a political movement with a charismatic leader who says he's representing the people versus the establishment or the elite. Um, these people say they're going to get back for the people what the establishment or elite have taken from them. But the problem is, they never they never make good on their promises. I think to a person, they use deceptive techniques and false beliefs to get people to think they're going in the right direction. They lie to the people who follow them. And they infuse these movements with emotion. They rabble rouse. They get them all fired up and charged up with their with their belief system. So these people are ready to go out and fight for them. Eventually, I mean that's in the beginning. Eventually, um, free speech is is usually is often eliminated. If we go further down into this rabbit hole of populism, I think there are two things. Well, three things for me that um, are a little bit different than what some other people are saying. This is from a psychoanalytic perspective. 
So I think the three things. Uh, one is the term splitting. It's, it's a defense mechanism. Another is projective identification. Um, and a, a way to think about that is blame shifting. It's, it's not me, it's you. It's, it's always you. It's, it's not me. I, I didn't do it. That's fundamentally what it is. But more technically, it's something about myself I don't like that oh, I can't tolerate it. So I put it on you. I project it onto you and say, hmm, you're the person who does that, not me. Um, so I've, I've kind of uh, incorporated blame shifting because I think it's much more understandable. Yeah. And by the way, projective identification is part of domestic violence. It's a part of um, just about everything you can think of that people do to each other, bullying, mean girls. It's something that someone's projecting onto the other person. Uh, a very quick example is bullying. Bullies have been bullied someplace in their lives. Absolutely. But rather than tolerate it, or and maybe they can't, but rather than doing anything about it, seeking help, um, telling somebody about it, they bully the kid on the playground, for example, who is maybe a little bit on the scrawny side. And he's the kid who isn't popular and is this and is that and whatever. So the bully's freed up from having to feel those things. So it's it's putting it on someone else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I, I I think that is what is going on, and and I think the way you describe it is is um absolutely kind of a, a doing that for the masses to kind of identify with, right? Mm -hmm. For 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 people who might be underserved or. Um, the situation I think you pointed out in, in uh, one of the chapters on what's been happening in the United States is that uh, more poverty is happening. People, it's, it's harder for it's, people are struggling. More people are struggling in order to make ends meet. They become reactive in general and oh, their, their, their minds and their brains kind of go offline with, with uh, kind of more pro-social thinking. And it's more apt for them to also project onto the other the, the unacceptable as a means to um, quickly that blame shifting to quickly um, reduce self blame or shame. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think you make a really good a point for that in the book. Uh, maybe you can kind of talk about, I think there was one, there was a Santa Cruz UFC Santa Cruz study that you mentioned. Do you remember that? And the five traits that were, kind of looked at with regards to Donald Trump? Um, well, there are plenty of traits with regard to Donald Trump. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think they said authoritarian personality syndrome, social dominance orientation, prejudice, intergroup contact, and uh, relative deprivation. I think what I just mentioned is kind of the relative deprivation of people. Or, uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. And um, but certainly that authoritarian personality syndrome. I mean, I know that this is their study, but I've never heard of that as an actual syndrome. Well, I it's it's a new syndrome. Um, I think it's it's uh, maybe uh, malignant narcissism on steroids. <laughs> OK, <laughs> All right. but I, um, basically all of these people are big time narcissists. Okay. And narcissists are really, they're insecure people, but Correct. they puff themselves up and they put all of these, it's as if putting costumes on. Obviously, they're very showy. They demand praise. They demand admiration. They feel entitled to whatever they want. And this is true of populism, populists across the board. Um, they care about themselves when it comes right down to it. Um and they're pros at exploiting people. So I think that it pretty much covers what you're mm -hmm. talking about um, in the yeah. big picture. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the, the, the intrapsychic or the internal processes that these people kind of magically, fluidly flip through by blaming others and, and just keeping everything, keeping the not me, the not me or the non-self or away okay. from 
or the bad self away from themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you give uh, some particular examples if you would like? You, you don't have to hit close to home. I think that a lot of people are uh, probably tired of hearing about Donald Trump, but if you want to use him, you can use <laughs> Donald Trump as an example. Um, or you can use, yeah. Plenty of good examples in the book that you give. It's not just him. It's not just us. Populism okay. is all, it's all over the place. Um, and it, well, if you just start with, we'll start with uh, Great Britain and kind of go around the world that way, if that's okay. Sure. Sure. Uh, obviously, sure. Boris Johnson, uh, now he's not there anymore, but he was a major populist. Uh-huh. Um, Poland um, is a populist country um, run by um, Morawiecki. Mm-hmm. A big major populist these days is Viktor Orban. And um, he is now really in with CPAC and that part of <laughs> Trump's party. And it's some of the things he gave his speech at CPAC recently, and it's it's really scary. He's talking about his idea of American and Hungarian troops somehow working together. Oh, that sounds like a grand uh, idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he's got a lot of ideas like that. I I, I understand from someone who sent me an article from uh, who who actually grew up in Hungary that when I believe she was in high school, they literally took the history books away and they replaced them with new history books and they've, they replaced them. What was history today is not history when the new books come in. One example is that a uh, Hungarian sent approximately, maybe a little less, but approximately 500,000 Jewish people to Germany. They ended up in Auschwitz, but Hungary doesn't want that stain. So they, you know, kind of project that elsewhere. Uh, the story mm-hmm. is that Viktor Orban can't stand George Soros, who is his benefactor to start. Uh, I saw that. And and in the book, you you outline how uh, two American Jewish uh, consultants helped him create this plan to smear George Soros, which now, of course, is all over the the Internet, like people probably in, you know, Costa Rica or, or everywhere, anywhere are blaming him for the price of onions or apples or something, right? Right. He started putting big billboards in Hungary about how bad George Soros was. Uh. And, um, but that's a way, that, that's one way, for example, people get rid of something about themselves or their history or their culture and put it on someone else. And then they're the bad uh, unscrupulous person. So it's, it's, uh, <laughs> this is all over the place, this phenomenon of blame shifting. You mentioned that in, in Poland, there's also kind of a wish to kind of eradicate responsibility for some of the atrocities against the Jews in World War II, right? You know, the it was same, the Germans, yeah. we didn't do it. Yeah. We didn't know. Yeah, that's right. We didn't do it. The Germans did it. Um, and also, things have really tightened up in Poland. Speaking of Poland, I, I don't know what's happened since the Ukrainian war has happened. I, I, it seems like they've been helpful to their, uh, uh, their not countrymen, but their uh, people in an adjacent country. But nevertheless, they've really cut down on free speech, uh, the government or one group owns most of the media. So saying what you want to say in Poland is is not something that's acceptable. Uh-huh. So that's really tightened up. Free speech is really tightened up in Poland, too. Um, there are lots of factions in Germany that are um, pro-populist groups. Uh, same is true in France. Uh, Marine Le Pen, I mean, yeah. she didn't win the election, but she got a lot of votes and her group is still going strong. 
So it's in Central and um, Eastern Europe. Are, they're filled with populace, um, as is Turkey. Uh, Erdogan is a major populace. Um, then just kind of, kind of going around the, the globe, um, as as I'm doing it here, um, India. Oh yeah, Mo- uh, Modi. Yeah, I've been. Modi. I I go to India a lot. My wife is uh, is Indian, and so I I go visit in law. So I'm very familiar with the the talk pro and con of mostly con about what's going on there. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen Modi project himself. He does some kind of 3D projection of himself. So he, uh, when he gives talks, all of the villagers have access to that. Th- this, <laughs> no, this, technology, that. this technology. So there, uh, Modi. Oh, yeah. Uh, here he is talk. So yeah, he's used technology uh, to his benefit for sure. Wow. Yeah. I, well, yeah, that is kind of creepy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just kind of moving down a little further, uh, quite a bit further. Um, uh, De Cherche, of course, in the Philippines, mm, yeah. is uh, a major populist. Now, he's thought of as a left-wing populist, and that's a little curious. Um, uh, the people in the Philippines, many of the people in the Philippines, I can't speak, I don't know the percentage, but they... They like part of what he's done because he's cut down on drug trade uh-huh. very strongly. In fact, he prosecutes people. I mean, whether they're guilty or whether they're innocent, if they have any anything to do with <laughs> drugs, they're, um, he's even killed people himself, and he's admitted it. So he doesn't need to prosecute them, <laughs> he just, or he does to the fullest extent. So that's one positive thing. But um, nevertheless, he's ruling the whole the whole country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you do. Uh, uh, it seems like the ones that stick out the most, the, the, the rock stars of populism are kind of on the right of things. Not, uh, yeah, exactly. uh, I, I wonder why that is. I mean, uh, you know, there are obviously... Uh, people who uh, do the same projective identification, et cetera, on the left, uh, is it is it less popular because uh, uh, those leaders don't reach into a bag of hoyeristic tricks and quickly uh, use basic language? I mean, are they less apt to use basic language and speaking to the people on the left or is it uh and, and like here it seems like everybody's really into poly their policy wonks even if they're leftist populist people i mean like bernie sanders is a he tends to be a nice guy and he doesn't 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 blame shit a, a lot i think, no, uh, I think for so his, he's kind of a populist right i mean but not a not in the same manner not a He's not trying to be a strong man. Although he would be definitely benign. Yeah, uh, benign populist, yeah. yeah. The church, that's, that's curious to me. Um, I, I'm i not really sure why. I mean, the, the people do like him, but then the people, uh, the people who like Trump like him. So I guess it's not just who, what kind of a yeah. family yeah. you have. Um, I... I think he 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 promotes women and he puts women down at the same time. So uh, you're talking I, about uh, uh, Trump or yeah, I'm just talking about Duterte. I guess I could. Oh, yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, he's put women in in powerful positions, and yet he says very disparaging things about them. Um, well, that's kind of there was a, a rape case and. Um, there was, I guess, discussion among reporters, and he said, well, something like, it's too bad. Um, I should have had first crack at this person. So, <laughs> it's it's pretty... Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, that's like... Pretty terrible. Yeah. And yet he, he promotes women, uh, I, I guess... He does. In some ways he does, yeah. They're able to yeah. to, to handle the, the sexism. I guess if they misogyny. can. Misogyny, yeah. 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 What somebody from the Philippines told me is that the Philippines is a very poor country and 
Uh, they tend to be rather, they can be rather docile. And he has done things for them. I think this one and one reason why he might be considered um, uh, a left wing populist. He's he's done a lot for uh, medical care or medical insurance to make sure people, many, many, many people are covered with health care that weren't covered previously. So he does have some things that he wants to do to um, help the people. But I mean, I'm certainly not here to defend him because he does some other atrocious things. Yeah. 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 Um, so we've kind of taken a, a global look at things. Of course, the, there's Turkey is another, another <laughs> spot where this is going on. Uh, right. it's, it, it almost seems like globalism, uh, maybe it reached its nadir point or it's, or it's height or something. And, and pluralism that goes along with that to some degree. And then people like it, maybe the glo- globalism has disempowered some parts of people within the countries that are participating in that. And then, uh, uh people step in to create order, so to speak, air quotes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and maybe that's why this is kind of a, a universal thing that's going on. Uh, our separate, kind of tribal experiences within our countries are, are, are not so well established or there's cracks in the system, so to speak. Well, resurgence is really, a, it, it's not just because I chose it. I, I think maybe Rutledge chose that particular word, but it really, it ebbs and flows. It, populism actually goes back to the fall of ancient Greece um, it's very old. There's a populist um, in in, in uh, ancient Greece uh, who was very narcissistic, and he, he, if he had modern day clothes, you would think he was on Fifth Avenue uh, because of the way he. I mean, he was very privileged, and he he acted that way, very narcissistic. So it it um, it goes way back, um, obviously. Yeah. But it seems like it is, it's, well, it doesn't seem like it is on the upswing. And so it's um, in uh, South America, Central America. And the, the question is, is it in America? Um, I would say Trump took us down that road. And where we go from here is a big question mark. It certainly isn't a given that we're going to have democracy in America forever. And I think many people, if if this were a conversation 10 years ago, five years, five years ago, I think um, people wouldn't resonate with it too much because I think many of us thought, well, yeah, of course, democracy has been here for 200 years. Yeah, of course. It's just a given. Our children will experience and their children will experience democracy, but they may not. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, yeah. I mean, that's kind of a can of worms. You're, you're welcome to describe how Trump took us down that road. Uh, maybe for people who, I don't know, haven't been watching the media or social media for the past you know, seven to 10 years or whatever, but uh, you're welcome to do that. Or maybe you could look at some of the contributing factors like you mentioned in the book, like social media. Well, social media, um, I think actually it's an interesting question today. I saw uh, Macron, the president of France, of course, uh, yesterday, and he was saying something about how social media started out to be a good thing, and now it isn't a good thing anymore yeah. because there's so much false information and fake news that gets distributed and then redistributed and then reposted and retweeted. And so that people believe, I mean, they believe these things that are outrageous that you, you I mean, most regular news uh, channels would not even think of saying these things. The thing with algorithms and social media is that people stay engaged longer. Therefore, they're more likely to buy something from the ads that pop up all the time. 
if there is uh, acrimony, if it's a contentious thing, a discussion going on, then people stay on longer. So that is only helping the company, the platform, uh, and the advertise the people who are advertising to have people actually have all of these contentious arguments uh, or listen to others who are having them and really get hyped up about it. Um, that, that can't be good. Yeah. Somehow, somebody has to get a grip on that. There has to be some regulation of that. Yeah, I think that people are getting siloed into their own non-socially engaged world on social media. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's also very powerful. And a, a lot of information has come out at how uh, a lot of the uh, AI has been programmed to keep you engaged uh, through various types of reward systems, intermittent rewards. Right. And, uh, and that's basically going back to conditioning. Mm-hmm. You know, types of conditioning. So they've utilized that to manipulate us. Um certainly doesn't help self-esteem. If your self-esteem goes down, you're going to look for an easy answer to, to feel better about yourself. And one way would be to go, as you were saying earlier, splitting, blame shifting, projection, mm-hmm. you know, like you're easier to buy into that, I suppose. Uh, it, it also seems like it's, it's uh, social media, no matter what it is, you're listening to someone who's the expert tell you about things. And if you do that long enough, it's going to shift your perspective on reality, whether it's good information or, you know, that, that uh, meets reality testing (laughs) or if it's, or if it's delusional thinking. And uh, as you know, like, like, and if you have enough of a a kind of a mass hysteria, Mm -hmm. if you will, uh, or a, a shift enough of the population shifts to a certain way of thinking, it's really difficult to root that out. Uh, and it, it, it's like if you've ever, I'm sure you have talked to somebody who's suffering from a delusion, you can't get them out of that kind of pretend mode bubble mm-hmm. and, and, and kind of get them into a back and forth that's, you know, reality, you know, reality testing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a mass pretend mode, this bubbles that are popping up all over the place and, and causing people to be fractured. I know that people are really getting down on, on social media. Now you mentioned that uh, Macron said that and yeah. here in the States was, I think it's um, who's the Senator from, from uh, Minnesota. Uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, you're talking about, I know you're yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, she's anyway, Democratic senator. She's looking into uh, taking care of like uh, moderating or controlling social media more, uh, maybe putting FCC rules upon it. That's good. And, and, and for goodness sakes, we, we really need to have the fairness doctrine, but back into the general media. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I recommended. It's some some commission, somebody needs to oversee it and to have consequences for um, infractions. I mean, somebody has to do something about saying anything at all with no basis in truth and having millions of people believe it. The other thing that's so hard about social media is that people feel like they belong to something. They can create any kind of person they want and they give followers and people who are lonely, disenfranchised um, in any way on the outside of any in group. If they have these unknown followers, that makes them feel good about themselves and this or they, yeah, it does. It it boosts their self-esteem and that even though it's, uh, smoke and mirrors, so to speak. It's not real. It feels real to them. So how do you, I mean, I don't know the answer, but how do you shift that around? I mean, I have some ideas about it, but it's, it, it's difficult. Well, okay. So what are some of those ideas? Maybe you can like put them out there. Or, you know. People are isolated because they don't feel part of a community anymore. Uh, There's so many splits and factions in communities that a lot of people in the same town, they don't talk to each other. Somehow we have to get back to community building in in some way. 
by talking about shared goals. Every community has something to be shared. Braver Angels, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Braver Angels, but it's a group that Bill Doherty and some someone else, I don't know the other person, but I do know Bill Doherty. And he started this um, right after the 2016 election because there was there were so many contentious things starting then. And he basically, uh, and it's a pretty large group now across the country, he gets red state and blue state people to attend workshops and he has them sit down and talk with each other about mm-hmm. things they disagree with and to find some common ground. I, I attended one of these. I was skeptical and uh, I attended several and it actually works in that sort of setting. Now, these people are agreeing to come in to talk. There are a lot of people who probably wouldn't. He's also done some of these groups on the Hill, but it's really impressive to to listen to people, listen to the other side in an atmosphere of respect. Uh, And that is sort of mentalization. I call mentalization active listening in in an atmosphere of respect because nobody really knows. Few people know what the word mentalization means, but it's impressive. And what they talk about is starting small, I mean, doing something on your block, having something with people, just say, this is just an example. I don't know that they say this thing in particular, but um, there are specifically, but if you have people on your block, you find out that the person that you didn't speak to because they're from another country, they actually had the same problems with the school that you do, or they have the same, uh, it, they say an issue with the bus driver. I mean, there there is commonality in communities, but we have to go back to talking with each other. Of somehow, I mean, it sounds it sounds impossible, but it it can't be impossible because people want to belong. I mean, that's a human that's a human need to belong. So. Yeah, I, I think that um, absolutely. And the fact that these are, you know, I don't, some of these are probably virtual now, but uh, hopefully they're not. Mostly they're just kind of like town hall meetings where people mm-hmm. get together. I mean, uh, it reminds me of like some of the classic uh, social psychology studies, like the in group, out group studies with the mm-hmm. owls and Kajifai, all right. The, I think that was the, the, the Turkish born social psychologists with the groups of kids who were on the owl team or the eagle team and pitting them against each other and then giving them a common purpose and and all of the anti or the in-group out-group group dynamics kind of collapsed and they became one group and connected with each other a lot more. Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of similar. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, social psychology explains a lot of what's uh, some of those theories, yeah. What's going on with this now, as far as like fracturing and in-group, out-group dynamics, and and how people can get a hold of those things when you're feeling siloed and and, uh, and lonely and and feeling despair. I well, that's one of the, if I may, that's one yeah. of the things I think. It, it, Trump did this, but so do other populist leaders. He's particularly yeah. good at it, and that is getting people to believe that he's for them. He's in their court. They, they feel like they belong to something. I think they, a lot of people think they can go down to Mar-a-Lago and just kind of walk in because he's one of their people. And obviously we know that would not ever work. Well, but, I, I wonder how many people have been, you know, told to get off the premises because I'm yeah. sure it's happened. That's I mean, they're, happened. you're right, right? He's a very yeah. good communicator in that way. Yeah. Um, Michael Diamond, who's a psychoanalyst, who's has written a book about ruptures in the American psyche, talks about something I talk about, but he uses a different language. And he talks about the regression that occurs in groups. Mm. And when I mean, why is it that otherwise law abiding citizens get together and they accept the things that Trump has done? And sometimes in the case of the insurrection, do these things themselves. And I think he would say, uh, Michael Diamond, that it's there's a regression in groups. Uh, people yeah. want to go along; they want to be accepted, so they participate. Uh, the way there's a, there's a term, actually, it's a mathematical term, but um, or it's used in mathematics, but it's also used now in politics. It's called st- stolastic terrorism. 
Mm. And what that means is basically another word for a rabble rouser. The scholastic, um, stochastic terrorist there you are. Uh, gets in front of the group, maybe at a rally and and uh, and uh, implies something. For example, this happened in, I believe it was North Carolina. Trump said, you know, Hillary's against guns. I, I don't know what will happen. You know, she may do banning of guns. I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but um, it's not it's not looking good. Now, has he actually done anything wrong? No. Well, <laughs> well also, he's he's let the, the people in the audience do the uh, supply the answer to what he's saying. That's so, right. So they feel that they've an agreement with him and they there's nothing there they can disagree with. Right. Yeah. So with, yeah. with stochastic uh, terrorism, yeah. it's. it's it's pretty certain that somebody will do something. You just can't predict who or when. And from this rally, somebody did do something with gun violence. Uh, uh, and that's it's it's the same idea of what happened with Mar a Lago and when the FBI came. Of course, Trump was the victim there. He, they they invaded his home. The FBI are terrible, as he portrayed it. And the men in Cincinnati went to uh, try to take over the FBI building. Unfortunately, that man was killed. But, I mean, Trump didn't go tell him to try to take over that. But people get the idea. Oh, yes, this leader who I really admire um, Oh yeah, yeah, and that seems to be it. Seems to have infected uh, other politicians. I guess Lindsey Graham is starting to do oh, that now absolutely. too, right? Like, oh, things could be bad. Absolutely, I have no idea why he would do that, but you know. Um, so you're right. I think that it, Trump's communication tactics and this this kind of uh, implication terrorism by implication. Mm-hmm. and dog whistling right to mm-hmm. to followers he seems to have done that he seems to have really created or, or pulled that out of his playbook uh and it seems to be infecting the rest of the party he's in mm-hmm. his current party he used to be a democrat yeah his current party yeah yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I think there are three parties actually <laughs> i think there's democrats republicans and the trump party <laughs> That's just okay. Fine. Oh, a little. All right. Yeah. Conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I. You know, it, it, one of the other problems is we don't have other parties. It's like we have a two-party system, and that seems to be maybe we're outgrowing that. I don't know. That's that's a people would argue against it for various reasons, but um. So we talked a bit about social media, and we talked about this kind of like idea of having. Uh, it was it Bill Doherty having these kind of like what what was the the project called again? It's it's called Braver Angels. They have Braver a website. Angels. It's it's um, they have a lot of information on their website. Okay. Um, people get involved in lots of ways, but it's very interesting group. Um, okay, Braver Angels. Yeah, and so those are two ways to kind of combat that. Um, how can people? I mean, these are good ways to kind of, you know, wrap your head around conceptually with the framework with these psychodynamic or psychoanalytic ideas. How else can can people out in the wide world kind of, in, I guess, protect themselves from from what's going on? I mean, what would you recommend to people uh, in the audience? How would they uh, keep themselves from this kind of mental virus that's out there? Well, I think people have to get involved. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can't get involved by speaking in enemy territory, then I think it's important to get involved with your own group. Um, I think you get involved in in a a local, on the local level, local politics. Um, I mean, you can start community things too, as I said, something on your block, but local politics, just to, to get involved so that, if everybody has a voice and everybody feels like they belong to something, I mean, it's a pretty good cause. Democracy is a pretty good cause. Um, I, I did an interview with Jamie Raskin and mm. writing something on a chapter in, in something that I'm editing uh, on democracy. And I mean, we have to get involved if we're going to save democracies. Every, every person did something. It would make a big difference. Um, 
you mentioned mentalizing, um, listening to people in an atmosphere of respect. You don't have to agree with people. I mean, if you just get the idea of respectful listening in the atmosphere of respect, that would be big. Now, how do you do it? Maybe slowly um, with a group of people in your neighborhood, in your community. Um, it, it's hard, but it's not impossible. That kind of reminds me of, uh, are you familiar with Joseph, Joseph Boyce, the German artist? Uh, Part of, so yeah, well, a little so. bit. What he did, uh, he took sculpture as being something a lot more uh, esoteric and even practical. And so he would do social sculpting. Mm -hmm. So he would go to places like at the time when it was very contentious in Northern Ireland. And he would mm -hmm. have the two sides, you know, the kind of Ulster Scots, uh, Paisley Party folks meet mm -hmm. with people who were um, um, home rule or wanting to, you know, the Catholic, you know, Irish folks uh, and would sit down and try to. To, to change and manipulate the, the group dynamics in a positive way by having them come together, right? And I mean, he would do that in various places and did that in communities. So kind of social sculpting is a kind of interesting thought about that. Uh, uh, and mentalizing, you mentioned, is being able to stay not reactive and stuck in your own kind of bubble or expecting you know, an exchange of goods or services and to meet, you know, to meet with people and accept them, uh, but rather and not transactional, but rather just sit and be mm -hmm. with them in a non-defensive kind of uh, respectful atmosphere. You're right. Yeah. 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 Well, any other things? Have we missed anything that you'd like to talk about from the book or anything else on your mind? I, I, don't, I don't I think you covered a lot. <laughs> Uh, we, also, covered, we covered a lot. We covered a lot. <laughs> and, there's and, also uh, one chapter on um, uh, the climate, climate change, and it mm -hmm. kind of at hand. People really need to get involved in that too, because there are a lot of problems with um, with global warming. So, and populists, um, they they contribute to it because they don't care about the resources of a country. Uh, they they use the resources for their own good. So that's why I wove in the importance of doing something, contributing to the effort to um, clean up the planet. There are people who think it has to be a much more radical approach because uh, the, the, um, the uh, date of no return, not, not that the planet will end but it won't be here anymore but there will be right. on places it used to be 2035 it may be sooner than that that now um, right which would would cause desperate shifts in in climate and possible resource issues and of course there's more desperation in the populace which yeah. in populace uh, which means populists could grab on to yeah 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 you're right and i think that that would be a one way to, uh, I know there's initiatives here in Chicago, like a clean river, you know, an urban rivers project where people get together and clean up the river and make it more livable for uh, wildlife and whatnot and just yeah. better atmosphere. So and yeah. for people. Yeah, excuse me. I think the key thing is to get involved in something that's helpful, whether it's politics or whether it's cleaning up the environment, just getting involved in a cause that can help people uh, in a community, in a state, or the country, how, however one does it. But if everybody did something, the place would be, uh, the world would be better off. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, we will close up that positive note. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Karen Messina, for being here. For those of you interested, the book is Resurgence of Global Populism, a Psychoanalytic Study of Projective Identification, Blame Shifting, and the Corruption of Democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott, very much. It was very enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah, same here.
Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Did you know you can find the Psychology Talk podcast everywhere? Well, maybe not everywhere, but you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. And we have a website, www.psych-talk.com. All material is copyright the Psychology Talk podcast. This podcast is for entertainment and informative purposes only. If you need a behavioral health specialist, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. Serenati.